Uh, it really is uh, an honor to be uh, given a chance to present this lecture. And uh, it's always fun to get together with new and, and old friends, and it's always fun to come to Canada. Uh, I, just by way of introduction, I'm going to be talking about bark beetles. And I think it, almost everybody here appreciates that these insects are both natural disturbance agents that contribute to a number of ecological functions and sources of socioeconomic losses when their numbers get beyond tolerable limits. And today I'm going to be talking uh, from that latter perspective. I'm certainly not going to be able to solve the bark beetle problem, but hopefully I can give some insights into some approaches we can take in dealing with such complex systems. By way of introduction, I want to first of all talk about the games by which bark beetles and trees play, things that can drive their numbers, things that constrain them, and factors that tip that balance one way or the other. And then after that, I want to really emphasize some of the key feedback processes and also how they differ among different systems. And I'm going to be talking about two systems that at first glance might seem quite different, the pine engraver and the mountain pine beetle, but in fact try to explore how the same processes are at work, the same feedbacks are at work, but the tip of those feedbacks is different, and so the emergent properties are entirely different. And then third, I'd like to explore a little bit about how we might anticipate responses of bark beetles to changing climate and some approaches we can take to getting the key information we need to try to mitigate and predict some of those responses. Now, at first glance, the bark beetle life cycle is deceptively simple. The adults emerge from the trees in which they develop. They land on a new tree. They enter it. They produce a pheromone that attracts a mate. They copulate under the bark. The female excavates a gallery along which she lays eggs. From that point on, the, ma the male's role is mostly uh, house cleaning chores. Uh, then the larvae hatch, they feed on the phloem and also on the fungi that the beetles introduce. They pupate, they emerge, and they complete the cycle. But in reality, a, a lot of things have to go right for beetles to be able to develop successfully. First of all, they have to locate the right tree. It has to be the right species. It has to be the right age category. It has to be the right physiological condition. Then they have to overcome all of those defenses as they're boring in. While they're feeding on the plant, there's a lot of things that feed on bark beetles. Those pheromones that I mentioned are not only attractive to the bark beetles themselves, but predators use those as cues to find the bark beetle prey. And in some cases, these predators are even more attracted to the bark beetle pheromone than the beetle is to its own pheromones. And while that's going on, it has to deal with a lot of other insects that can now utilize this resource. And some of these insects are quite good at competing with bark beetles, and some of them produce their own pheromones. Those pheromones attract new predators, and once inside the tree, these are generalists that even feed on the poor bark beetle, the mountain pine beetle in this case, that went through all of the effort in the first place. And just like us having a picnic, they have to hope for good weather, which is totally outside their control. Now, the overwhelming majority of work done on bark beetles has done, been done during outbreaks. And I think this gives us a very skewed impression. It makes us visualize the forest as one big salad bar and nothing could be further from the truth. Trees respond viciously to attack. As soon as the beetle starts to enter it, there's resin exuded from the entrance site that can entomb the beetle. While that's going on, the beetle begins killing its own tissue in advance of the tree, the tree begins killing its own tissue in advance of the beetle fungus complex. It's been referred to as a scorched earth strategy, which was adapted as a military strategy many millions of years later by humans. And while that is going on, the tree is very rapidly undergoing biosynthesis of these toxins. And the toxins present in the tree can increase easily by a hundredfold fold 
with only, in only about three to seven days. And this far exceeds the tolerance of the beetles or the fungi. And these different components work in concert. While these biosynthetic reactions are going on, the resin is delaying the beetle and buying the tree time. And even this is a gross oversimplification. If I just take one component of that, the defensive chemistry, actually that is an entire battery of compounds. And I've just listed here from just one tree, red pine, the various uh, bioassays with beetles, and how different components of the tree chemistry interfere with those. And collectively, they interfere with everything the beetle and the fungus need to do. And even that is a gross oversimplification. Because if you take just one of these, monoterpenes in this case, that's actually about a dozen different compounds. And so when you look at something like this, you wonder how is it the bark beetles can ever reproduce? Well, there's a couple ways they can do it. One is by avoiding trees that have high concentrations of defensive chemicals. And this is a little bioassay we do where we scrape the bark off the tree and flash off all of the chemicals in it. And then we mix it with agar and water. We nickname it log jam. And then we put the beetle in there and it can decide whether or not to enter. We basically ask the beetle, do you feel lucky today? And it can decide to go in or not. And what you see for three different species is when concentrations of the defense compound are very low, it's likely to go in. But as those concentrations go up, the likelihood the beetle will enter goes down. And you also see there are differences among different species. And so if you look at spruce beetle here, an outbreak species, it's actually uh, enticed to go in by the levels that are in the constitutive pre-attack phloem, uh, which would be about 1.5. If you look at something like Ips tridans, any monoterpenes is pretty much enough to scare it off and Ips pinei is somewhere in the middle. And there is also plasticity within a particular bark beetle species, and that's a point I'm going to return to. The other way they can deal with it is by overcoming these defenses through mass attack, exhausting those defenses. And the beetles have an absolutely exquisite system in which they take those defensive chemicals and use them as biosynthetic precursors of their aggregation pheromones that then mass attack the tree, and they also use them as synergists. So as long as the tree is fighting back, more and more beetles are coming in. It's an early version of jujitsu. When there are low numbers of beetles, uh, the beetle is going to be killed. As it increases, they look like they're starting to break things down. And when they are successful, there is no evidence of that tree ever having had any defensive capability, regardless of what it had in the first place. So it's not a matter of human wave assaults where the first wave gets killed or anything like that. It's a collective success. And within just two to three days, in the case of mountain pine beetle, that resin flow response I showed you is diminished by about two thirds and the capability for undergoing inducible defenses is totally compromised. So when you see something like this, you wonder how is it the tree can ever survive? Well, one way it can do it is by jamming that communication system. And this is some work that Nadir Irbujin did when he was in our lab. And he manipulated the ratio of the host terpene to the beetle pheromone. This is work with Ips pinei, and this is the arrival in funnel traps. And when it was just the pheromone alone, this was his arrival rate. When he added some terpenes, there was indeed synergism. But then when he added more, it dropped right back down to the pheromone alone. There no longer was synergism. And when he added even more, there was inhibition by the by response of these beetles. And to try to relate this to the intact system, as best as we can tell, in the natural system, that first beetle, that ratio would be about 150 here, just where there's some synergism. But if the beetle is not able to kick off aggregation in three days, we're now up to about 1,300, which is here. Things are starting to go south for the beetle. And if seven days have gone by, we're now at 27,000. 
which would be someplace way off the chart, very low likelihood of it uh, initiating a mass attack. And this is not unique to Gisips pinei. It's been shown with the European spruce beetle and closer to home with mountain pine beetle. During those inducible responses I referred to, we see a doubling in the amount of a compound called 4-alyanosol, and this is a compound that inhibits the response of the flying mountain pine beetles to the attractive signal being emitted by that first mountain pine beetle. So when, again, when you see something like this, you wonder how is it the beetle can ever survive. So hopefully what has emerged from this introduction is a very precarious balance that could tip one way or the other depending on the outcome of competing rate reactions. And what tips that balance one way or the other are stresses, environmental stresses, that are exogenous to the system. And this is just a collection of data we've generated over the years with a couple different systems. And it doesn't matter what kind of stress, it's going to greatly diminish the ability of the tree to undergo those inducible defensive reactions. So if you look at it from the beetle standpoint, it really comes down to which tree should you attempt to colonize? And there are trade-offs in that. You can go after trees with very weak defenses, such as this wind-thrown lodgepole pine. That's a safe way to go. There's no defenses there. On the other hand, there's only so many wind-thrown and lightning-struck pines out there, and the beetle has to complete this every generation, and so it's a very ephemeral resource. Also, it's not just available to mountain pine beetle, it's available to everybody else. And so this gallery here is the mighty mountain pine beetle. It's a blow up of this little piece of bark right here. And the poor animal is completely surrounded by all of these competing beetles and has little chance of reproducing. Also in general, the trees that are under stress tend to have thinner phloem and phloem is the substrate on which their larvae feed, so you're not going to produce very many. The alternative is to go after a healthy tree. The risk is you might get killed trying. On the other hand, these trees are abundant. You don't have to deal with many competitors. The other species are not going to go after those trees. And in general, they tend to have thicker phloem and be able to yield more brood. So what should a beetle do? Well, we know the answer to that. The overwhelming majority of bark beetle species only live in this kind of environment. And those, trees, those uh, uh, bark beetles that we tend to think of as outbreak species, during the non-outbreak periods, with, which in a stand can be 30 to 40 years, they're going to be more associated with the highly stressed trees. So I wanted to explore explore that a little bit more deeply with two systems. One is Ips Pina, and we'll begin the story in Wisconsin. In the Great Lakes region, the major tree killing species is the pine engraver, Ips Pinae. And so we've asked three questions. What drives tree mortality? What are some of the higher scale factors that can amplify these drivers? And does the system reach a point where it becomes self-driving? And to make a very long story short, and this is thanks to a number of absolutely fantastic students I've been blessed to have over the years, we, we have a pretty good idea of what is going on. It begins with root and lower stem beetles, such as uh, Dendroctinus valens and Hylobius radicus. They invade the root system and they introduce fungi in the genus Leptographium. This is not lethal to the trees but it is one of those stresses that compromises the defenses of the main stem against Ips pinei. Ips pinei then mass attacks those trees, kills them, and then even after they're dead, some more secondary weevils come in and introduce more leptographium. The leptographium then passes through these root grafts and the process just continues on and on. And we see these pockets, these gaps forming a very clustered type of mortality. And this is some long-term data we have, and what you can see, each one of these dots is one year, 
and the percentage of trees killed by ibs that had prior root infestation by things such as turpentine beetles and root collar beetles was always very high, but it did vary quite a bit, and it varied with drought. This dotted line is a typical year in Wisconsin. Everything above that, almost all the trees killed by ibs had prior root infestation. But above that, the insect does start colonizing trees that had this alternate form of stress, and it might look like the beginning of an outbreak. But when we look at the percentage of attacked trees that had prior uh, root infestation as a function of number of attacked trees, we really don't see much positive feedback. Even when the Ips numbers get very high, almost all of the trees it's picking had this kind of uh, stress. And I can say from experience, when these droughts are over, they go right back to being along the rings of these pockets. And so that suggests some management approaches. And what I've shown here is just the, the uh, exact same feedback loop as before. This is just repeating it. This is indicating it would take quite a population increase for this system to become self-driving. And so some possibilities are, well, what if we sever the root grafts that the leptographium are moving along? What if we prevent establishment by those predisposing insects, such as Dendroctinus valens? And what about if we conserve predators? And so we've tried some of these ideas, uh, given the underlying feedback. And this is a study where we severed root grafts about 10 meters in advance of the above ground symptoms. And that's based on some root excavations we did where we found the predisposing fungi are about six meters in advance of those symptoms. And we had 10 stands that were asymptomatic. These were control stands where there were no dying trees. We had eight stands that had this syndrome and we did not apply this. And we had eight stands where we severed the root grafts about 10 meters in advance. And we were quite pleased with the results. If you look at the red pine mortality here, in the asymptomatic stands, there was essentially no mortality either inside or outside this imaginary root sever area. In the symptomatic stands, the mortality inside the, either the real root severing or the imaginary root severing was the same. But where we did the root severing, the amount of tree mortality beyond that zone was only about a third. The second approach we mentioned, I mentioned, was to try to um, cut down on the amount of Dendroctinus valens coming into the system. And we tried to incorporate this into a routine silvicultural practice, namely thinning, and simply manipulating the time of the thinning. And so we had 13 stands where the thinning was done in the summertime, 11 stands where it was done in the spring, and 11 stands where there was no thinning. And we monitored this for four years. And again, the results in this system were encouraging. This shows the average number of beetles per year in our traps. This is red turpentine beetle. And here in the non-thin stand, there essentially were no turpentine beetles. But it's not, that's not really very practical because you really do need to thin these stands. If you do your thinning in the spring, the number of red turpentine beetles coming in is quite high and the populations continue to increase thereafter. On the other hand, if you do your thinning in uh, the summer, the populations are much lower and we see that benefit extending for at least four years. And the third avenue, the third opportunity for managing these kinds of plantations has to do with those predators I talked about that are attracted to this system. When Nadir was a graduate student, one of the things he documented quite well was that tree mortality in these stands was associated with low predator populations. I think as many of you know, one possibility of managing bark beetles is to try to trap out populations using those pheromones I described, synthetic pheromones. There's pros and cons to that method, and one of the biggest cons is that in the process, you end up trapping out lots of those predators that are helping you uh, because they're also attracted to those pheromones. Uh, 
Well, I've been using the term pheromone all along as if it were one chemical, but in fact it's a mixture of chemicals. In our system, it's plus ipstyenol, minus ipstyenol, and linerone. And we were curious if by manipulating those three compounds, we could tailor make certain cocktails that would selectively remove the pest, but not remove the predator. And these were our treatments. We had six different treatments. We had nine traps per site in no choice conditions, which is more rigorous. We wanted to simulate a trap out. We rotated the treatments among different sites. And we did it twice per year for two years. And we wanted to find out, is this unique to Wisconsin or uh, elsewhere? And so we did the exact same experiment in California. And the results are summarized here. This is the ratio of pests to predators removed. So when that's below one, that's really bad news. You're actually removing more predators than when you are pests. The bigger it gets, the more selective you are. And I think you can see, uh, here's the dotted line indicating one, essentially breaking even. Depending on the mixture you choose, you can actually be removing more predators than Ips pinei, or really bias it very strongly in favor of removing Ips pinei. Timing can also greatly increase that. If you can wait till summer, that's a huge benefit. And we saw the same thing in California as in Wisconsin, but the solution is different. Those compounds, which are the ideal ones to be using in California, are exactly the absolute worst ones to be using in Wisconsin. And so when we turn to mountain pine beetle, this is an insect that, again, plays by the exact same rules of the game, has the exact same feedbacks, but the net feedbacks turn out to be quite different, and so the emergent properties are quite system different, and so the alternatives for management are going to turn out to be quite different. But we approached it the same way from the standpoint of feedbacks. We asked two questions. What constrains beetle populations? Because they do spend most of their time in the endemic, not epidemic condition. And does the system become self-driving? And we recently finished a large-scale experiment in collaboration with Alan Carroll at UBC and Jörg Bowman at UBC. And there were essentially two main components to the study. Overall, we wanted to find out how does a, a, a tree level trait, namely defensive chemistry, interact with a stand level trait, namely population size. And so we monitored beetle attacks over six years in six large lodgepole pine stands in BC. And they conducted a monthly 100% census. And this was a long enough and well replicated enough study that Alan set up for us to be able to watch populations transition within and among sites. The second part was trying to relate beetle attack to tree physiology. So prior to the flight season, we examined constitutive resin flow and chemistry, that resin flow I showed before, and also the induced resin flow and induced chemistry in response to simulated attack. And we simulated attack by a combination of a mechanical wound and then the uh, fungus that the beetle vectors. And then we just sat back and let mountain pine beetle tell us the answer. When we looked at the tree attack data, if you look at population size here, that varied quite a bit among and between sites, which is what you would expect an outbreak insect to do. But if you look at the proportion of trees that were entered by mountain pine beetle, in which mountain pine beetle was able to elicit a mass attack, that proportion went anywhere from zero to 100, depending on the number of beetles in the stand level population. And it's not just a matter of some stands being more favorable than others, although I'm sure that's true because you can see some stands like B or A all the way across. And it's not just a matter of some years being better for the beetle than others, although I'm, not, I'm sure that's true because for any year you can see the range. The real driver here was population size. And so the important take home message here is that tree defense 
is absolutely critical in whether an outbreak can start, but absolutely inconsequential once an outbreak is underway. When we looked at the tree physiology, we saw the exact same response for all four of the parameters we looked at, and so I'm only going to show you the one that showed the closest correlation, and that was inducible accumulation of monoterpenes in response to simulated attack. And we look at, when we compare trees that were not attacked versus those that were, those that were not attacked had inducible defenses twice as strong as those that were not when the beetle was in the endemic phase. When the beetle was in the intermediate phase, the transition phase, that relationship was lost. We no longer saw a difference. And when the beetle was in the eruptive phase, not only was that relationship lost, but it was actually reversed. We got a completely different answer to the question. Trees were act the beetles were actually, actually going off after the well-defended trees. And we can see that this way here. This is the percentage of trees in the stand with, in this case, resin below that of the attacked trees. And from the beetle standpoint, they are really culling off the bottom. And then when the population starts to transition, they're a little closer here, just above 50%. And then when they're in the eruptive stage, they're actually going out of their way to select the better defended trees. Now it kind of raises the question, why would a mountain pine beetle attack a well-defended tree? And I always think of the response, uh, the gangster Willie Sutton was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. And if you're a mountain pine beetle, the answer to the question is, because that's where the phloem is. And when we looked at these defensive parameters, in fact, the larger trees were more well defended. There's a strong relationship between tree size and defense. And this was a little bit surprising at first because there is a strong relationship between outbreaks and large trees. And that's a well-documented relationship. But it's easy to infer from that that larger trees are more susceptible and in fact, that's not true. It's because there's some kind of predisposing factor that allows the population to be large enough to now exploit those larger trees, which are the ones with the thicker phloem, more nutritious, and yield them more beetles, and so you get a positive feedback cycle going. And you can see the beetles' uh, footprint here. This is the diameter of attacked to unattacked trees. In the endemic phase, that's right around one. When it's in the transition, that's gone up. And in the eruptive phase, it in fact is getting the uh, larger trees. And we've also seen this kind of thing with spruce beetle as well. And I don't have time to talk about the mechanism by which uh, spruce beetle does this, but it's a combination of genetic changes in the population and signals coming off from the presence of other spruce beetles. And just to uh, illustrate this point in a comparative way. This is the exact same slide I showed you with Ips pinei before, the percentage of attack trees that had prior root infestation, a very weak response with population size. And this is the same thing with mountain pine beetle. Here the predisposing agent is the lower stem colonizing Pseudips mexicanus. And when mountain pine beetles are, populations are low, almost all of them are attacking these trees that are very stressed, poor resource, but once its population has passed that critical threshold, they leave that predisposing agent behind and almost all of the trees they're attacking do not have that prior stress. So then from a management standpoint, those alternatives I suggested for Ips pinei don't seem very applicable for mountain pine beetle. What really seems applicable here is very early, preemptively keeping the population from transitioning from the non-outbreak to the outbreak phase. Well, given that any kind of stress can compromise the resistance of a tree, that's quite a challenge, and so you need some kind of prioritizing. And so we wanted to explore on a higher scale two different kinds of 
uh, environmental perturbations that occur at different scale. One that is a bit more localized wildfire and the other is more regional uh, weather extremes. We just finished two large scale studies uh, exploring how wildfire may affect the population dynamics of mountain pine beetle. One was done in northwestern Wyoming, the other one in northeastern Utah. In the first one, we had 16 stands. Eight were burned, eight were not burned, and these were evenly distributed between stands where the mountain pine beetle was in the endemic versus eruptive population phase. The other one was uh, kind of a mirror image to it. It was one large fire, but we studied it over a longer period to evaluate population responses. This just shows four sites with uh, lodgepole pine. We also had four with ponderosa pine. When we looked at the results from Wyoming and asked the question, is mountain pine beetle more likely to attack lodgepole pines that have been injured by wildfire? The answer is yes, but. They show a real preference for trees that have moderate level of injury. They got a few of the trees with light injury, did not attack any unburned trees, and did not attack any severely burned trees when they were in the endemic phase. In those stands where they were in the eruptive phase, they showed the same preference pattern, but now once again, things were expanding and they were starting to get some of the unburned trees, but the preference really is here for the moderately injured trees. And it turns out these beetles are pretty smart. They know what they're doing. When we looked at brood production, this is the per capita increase in those trees, we saw a parabolic relationship where brood productivity on a per capita basis was higher in those moderately wildfire injured trees. Why? Because when they were in these trees here, they encountered host defense. And even when they were over, able to overcome host defense, as in these trees, that mass attack required so many beetles to overcome the defenses that the intraspecific competition was 10 times higher here than in these trees here. How'd they do in the highly injured trees? Well, not so well either. For one, the substrate quality was lower and it was available to lots of other insects such as wood borers like monocamus, uh, bark beetles like pityoctones and ips and interspecific competition was 25 times higher here than in the unburned trees. So, okay, if you're a mountain pine beetle, colonize moderately injured trees. Well, that's easier said than done because these are relatively rare on the landscape. When we looked at the trees in these transects, only about 22% of the trees were in that category and they basically all got used up the first year. And even that 22% is a gross overestimate of availability because we did this in transects extending from the burn edge and in fact, all of these trees here in the center of the burn would be in the high category. And there's only so many burns on the greater landscape and the overwhelming majority of trees would be in the non-affected category. And when we looked at the population data from, uh, well, this is still from Wyoming, we tried to make some kind of an index of what's the overall population doing. It's not an easy thing to do because this is not a uh, closed system. So basically, we just integrated the number of trees in each burn category, the corresponding attack rates, which I already showed you, and the resulting brood production, which was in that parabolic slide, uh, slide I showed you, and you get an overall index of stand level brood production. When it was in the endemic phase, the unburned trees, the beetle came out zero, just never attacked any of these trees. And even in the burn trees, very, very little, basically just hanging in there, avoiding going extinct. In the epidemic phase, there did appear to be some kind of a boost from the wildfire in terms of beetle populations. And so I think our interpretation from this system is that wildfire may add to outbreaks that are already in progress,
but is unlikely to foster the transition from the endemic to the eruptive phase. And the same thing happened in Utah. This just shows one measure of fire injury, cambium kill rating. This is the percentage of attacked trees in that category. The year after the fire, 2007, again, it preferred to moderately injured trees. And after that year, it did start moving over into these uninjured trees. There was some evidence of positive feedback, and it looked like it might be an incipient outbreak. But it wasn't enough to get it over the hump. As the years went on and the beetles started attacking the healthy trees, the percentage of attacks that ended up in failure to tree resistance went up. And the population here showed an initial increase, and then it went down. And the same thing happened in ponderosa pine, only in ponderosa pine it was even more catastrophic from the beetle standpoint. The population went up, and then it really crashed after that. So it doesn't appear that wildfire would be enough by itself to initiate an outbreak. Well, what about something on a larger scale? We've just completed an analysis in collaboration with Alan Carroll and Brian Alkema and others, in which we looked at three large outbreaks, mountain pine beetle in British Columbia, spruce beetle in British Columbia, and pinionips, a very large outbreak in the southwestern US. And for each of these, we asked, did the outbreak coincide with a weather deviation from the norm? But then beyond that, we asked, was the population change correlated with a weather anomaly during three separate phases? The onset of the outbreak, the continuation and the decline. And third, is there evidence that the population became self-driving? And these are the results, and I'll just walk you through them. Uh, this shows the three insects here, mountain pine beetle, spruce beetle, and pinionips. In all three cases, we found a correlation between the onset of the outbreak and a predisposing factor. In the case of mountain pine beetle, it was drought. Spruce beetle was high temperatures. Pinionips was drought. But in the case of mountain pine beetle and spruce beetle, the continuation of the outbreak no longer relied on that predisposing factor. And that's shown graphically here. These are just the years of the various outbreaks. This is the amount of acres in infected. When there is a correlation between tree mortality and that predisposing factor, it's shown here in blue. When there was no correlation, it's shown in orange. And you could see that for mountain pine beetle and spruce beetle, some of the years with the highest tree mortality occurred even after that initial outbreak, uh, the, that initial uh, condition that released the outbreak was relaxed. The populations had become self-sustaining. In the case of pinionips, we see something very, very different. It was responding to drought, tracking this source of trees, but there's no evidence that the population became self-sustaining. And I think there's some important lessons here. One is that not all outbreaks are alike. Even though they may have the same morphology, such as that red pine situation and the mountain pine situation, the underlying drivers can be quite different. And because of that, as policymakers, we may have a preference for one size fits all policy, but they're not very adaptable. As managers, it shows you really have to consider the underlying dynamics. I think another consideration from a uh, climate change standpoint is very alarming because as many of you know, uh, climate change forecasters predict not only increasing means of temperatures and increasing droughts, but also increase variance about the mean. And what's troubling there is when you have a predisposing factor, the insect after that can uh, take things over on itself. Well, everything I've been talking about so far really talks about the environment as if it were a constant. And of course, we all know that's not true. The environment is changing. Things are getting warmer. And as a number of outstanding authors have pointed out, mountain pine beetle is moving into higher latitudes 
and higher elevations. And now it's entering some areas where it has not historically been and is both an environmental threat in, in addition to some of the other kind of problems they can cause. How can we anticipate how it's going to behave? I think we should look at some of these same underlying drivers. And if we look at tree defense, it appears so far that trees with less historical exposure are less well defended. Uh, Cudmore and Associates found that areas of BC where, lodge, uh, where lo uh, lodgepole pine had not been exposed to mountain pine beetle were likely to produce more brood. And we found that in whitebark pine elevation stands, uh, where mountain pine beetle was now accessing them thanks to warming climate, uh, these trees had very poor inducible defenses relative to mountain pine beetle. They basically, when they were challenged, either by the fungus we used to simulate the attack or the beetle itself, these trees just didn't get it, basically stayed there. As, as you know well here, mountain pine beetle is also moving eastward as well. It's breached a biogeophysical barrier of the Rocky Mountains. It's causing problems in Alberta. And the question is, how is this insect going to behave in the boreal forest? And of course, we in Wisconsin are very concerned. How is it going to behave in the Great Lakes region when it starts interacting with red pine, our main uh, plantation species, white pine, and jack pine. And I guess uh, I certainly can't answer that question. I would say that one of the casualties of climate change is our, our level of understanding. We have to admit that we now uh, are basically rookies all over again when it comes to this system. But what I would suggest is that we look at it from a multivariate uh, perspective and a multi-scale perspective that we need to be doing climate modeling, incorporating things such as temperature and precipitation, but we also need to consider landscape factors such as forest structure, uh, predisposing agents, natural enemies at the stand level, and at the tree level, things such as host defense and symbionts. And just to give some overview of some of our findings so far, uh, because we've worked with the chemistry of jack and red and white pine in the Great Lakes region, we have some basis for comparing their chemistry to that of lodgepole pine. And so this is just a percent composition on the y-axis. Uh, lodgepole is in green, jack pine is in black, red pine is in red, white pine is in wine. I'm not, uh, red pine's in uh, red, white in uh, white, uh, white bar. And I've shown three of the compounds, alpha pinene, myrcene, and 4 alley anisole. I mentioned earlier that mountain pine beetle uses some host terpenes as a precursor of its aggregation pheromone. That terpene is alpha pinene. And if you compare alpha pinene, it's much more abundant in jack pine, red pine, and white pine in Wisconsin than it is in lodgepole pine in uh, Wyoming or Montana. I mentioned that the beetle sometimes uses uh, terpenes from the host plant as synergists of its aggregation pheromone. Uh, myrcene is one of those primary synergists. Myrcene is every bit as high in jack pine, and I was relieved to see not quite as high in red and white pine as in lodgepole pine. And here's our old friend for alley anisole, which is important in inhibiting the response of mountain pine beetle to its aggregation pheromone. This is the level here in lodgepole pine, and so far we have not even been able to detect it in jack pine or red pine. It is plentiful in white pine. So overall, I think this gives us some kind of a peek at what to expect. It raises some concern that mountain pine beetle may have an easier time initiating mass attacks in the trees of the Great Lakes region than in its historical zone. And basically, if you can just visualize that uh, graph that we generated in collaboration with Alan Carroll, how many beetles it takes in the stand to be able to make a mass attack likely to occur, you can just visualize uh, that graph being shifted to the left. 
I think it's also important to start exploring natural enemies, and I would suggest a useful model for thinking about mountain pine beetle is one insect that has already spread from one end of the continent to the other. And this is spruce beetle. This is the uh, complete range of spruce beetle. It tends to be far more problematic in the west than in our area in Wisconsin. And I think there may be some advantage to some collaborative studies exploring this insect so that we can do bioassays with it. And I just wanted to show here uh, three different regions, the number of predators per beetle, competitors per beetle, and in some work we did with uh, Skeeter Werner in Alaska, there's hardly any predators out there. Compare that to coastal Alaska, some work by Gara, and compare that to what we found in Wisconsin, a much heavier predator load. And if you look at competitors, uh, it was rather low in uh, interior Alaska, a bit higher in coastal Alaska, and what we found in uh, Wisconsin just completely blew this insect uh, out of its logs. And I think if we even uh, expand that a little bit, here's some results with mountain pine beetle we have. The same kind of data, predators per beetle here. This is Montana, Wyoming. This is what we found Ips pinei has to deal with. This is what Ips grandicolis has to deal with. Uh, again, the predator load tends to be higher, the competitor load and the competitor load tend to be higher in our region. So that's some reason for encouragement. Now what we don't know is how attractive, attracted are these beetles to mountain pine beetles pheromone. If they're out there and they're just re, uh, responding to the other uh, bark beetles, then that's not going to help us very much. We are doing some studies right now. We just finished a second year of uh, field work where we took lures of mountain pine beetle pheromone, put them out in Wisconsin, and basically made that a pretend mountain pine beetle to see how many predators would come in. We don't yet have the data on that. So just to wrap it all up, uh, what I would say is a take home message is that every phase of the bark beetle conifer interaction generates feedbacks. These can be both negative that reduce beetle success and positive that amplify beetle success. And it's the net feedbacks that dictate whether the beetles breach a series of thresholds. And this series of thresholds is at every stage of the interaction, from host entry, from aggregation, from overcoming tree defense, to transforming from the endemic to the eruptive phase. Secondly, fine scale processes are critical to whether or not thresholds are surpassed, but they may have no effect after that threshold is surpassed. The key drivers interact across multiple scales of space and time, and so some fine scale drivers such as tree biochemistry and insect behavior are strongly influenced by stand level inputs and feedbacks such as defoliators and root insects and drought and elevated temperature. The third, host selection behavior is plastic. Not all bark beetles are alike, not even in the same bark beetle species. Their behavior reflects selective pressures on individuals arising from tree defense, forest structure, and population density. Behavioral change is a critical feedback that, both, that can drive transitions into the outbreak dynamics. We see this especially with mountain pine beetle. From a management standpoint, I think it's useful to categorize the different bark beetle species into the ones that are likely to become self-driving versus those which are not likely to become self-driving. And in those systems where the external incitants are required for the outbreak to continue or expand, such as Ips pinei, then directing the control tactics at the predisposing agent or at augmented natural enemies can be effective. On the other hand, in the systems where the beetles can become self-driving, employing rapid responses that prevent breach of the stand level population thresholds is the best option. Now you have to prioritize in order to do that. I certainly can't give a, a complete prescription, but I would suggest think about the scale and that yes, all physiological stresses predispose trees to beetle attack, but their spatiotemporal patterns 
dictate which make transition into an outbreak more likely. And so the f wildfires by itself were not enough to transition outbreaks. On the other hand, if during that period where the beetle was first responding to it, there happened to have been a drought event or a very warm period, then that likely would have kicked it past the threshold where it would become uh, self-perpetuating. That's going to be very challenging for our colleagues who are modelers because some of the same factors can predispose to both wildfire and bark beetle outbreaks such as uh, drought and also we know from predictions climatologists have done to anticipate an increased frequency of wildfires in the future. Uh, tree characteristics that favor beetle reproduction at low populations are not necessarily those that are correlated with outbreaks. You know, we like to say a lot that correlation does not denote causation. But I think we often forget the opposite of that, that the absence of correlation does not denote the absence of causation. And we can see that when the, we explore tree defense in resistance, how something can be so critical in whether or not an outbreak occurs, but is it correlated with the onset of the outbreak once it's underway, how quickly it, it, it moves, how big it gets? Absolutely not. And then finally, new habitats in the which bark beetles are expanding via climate change include elements of both increased vulnerability and protection. We currently lack the data to predict the extents to which each will prevail, and we lack the data on knowing how to best mitigate their impacts. But I think what I can say with a high degree of certainty is that an integrated approach is, a is going to be necessary that includes both uh, biotic and abiotic elements and is going to have to be multiscalar. Everything I've done here is uh, through collaboration and I have been really fortunate to have an absolutely terrific bunch of collaborators and students. This is what brings uh, real joy to what it is we get to do. Celia Boone assisted with a lot of the chemistry. Alan Carroll and Brian Alkema with a lot of the uh, modeling. Monica Turner and Phil Townsend were collaborators on the uh, fire project in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Kimberly Wallen did all of the work with uh, spruce beetle behavior and the genetics of spruce beetle behavior that I didn't delve into detail. Barbara Bentz and Andy Lurch collaborated on the wildfire project in Utah. Nadir did so much of the uh, literally groundbreaking work, if I could make that pun, with the uh, red pine system and how these uh, fungi move below ground. Uh, Jörg assisted with a lot of the chemistry, and Aaron Powell took the lead on the wildfire project in Wyoming. And I appreciate your attention. Uh, I hope this is helpful, and I'll do my very best to try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.